Daring Abroad, brought to you by Equity Bank Diaspora Banking. On this episode of Daring Abroad, we feature Professor Chapuruha Makoha Kusimba, who, together with his wife, teach the same subject, that is anthropology, at the same university, the American University in Washington, D.C. I grew up in Akuru, and I went to school in Western Kenya. Uh, Kimirili Boys and Chesamis High School, and in 1987, I came to the United States uh, for postgraduate studies. There are different branches of anthropology. Professor Kusimba specializes in archaeology. Archaeology is uh, a study that looks at the deep history of uh, humanity, uh, from the origins of uh, humankind, basically to the present. Research, which goes hand in hand with academic work, has seen the couple travel to different parts of the world to undertake studies on mankind. Kenya has one of the longest histories of human activity uh, of anywhere in the world, so I was very interested in learning more about what people have been doing in Kenya over very long periods of time, how they've been interacting with the environment and creating ways of life. In different parts of the country. Most of my research has primarily been on the Kenyan coast. Uh, here in the United States I've done some historical archaeologists among African Americans uh, in the state of Illinois. I've done some research in Madagascar. The couple says Kenya should be proud to be identified as the home to the cradle of mankind. Uh, Trukana's place is very, very important because here is one of the few places where we have found continuous evidence of humankind, ancestors of humankind living there, existing there for at least four million years. Before you met Kusimba, had you been to Kenya before? Had you had an experience in Kenya? So I had been like on one kind of student trip. I was really interested in these early humans, and so I had gone to Kubifora, you know, that place which is near Lake Turkana, where there it's just very, it's just kind of rocks. There's nothing up there but rocks, but that's where people, uh, you know, prospect for early hominids. Professor Sibel, who is of Turkish origin, says while undertaking research in Kenya later on, she got interested in digital money transfer. But when I got the system on my phone, I was able to keep some small amount of money to use it for shopping. I could also send money to my mother-in-law in Bungoma, and that's very important, to send money for some sugar or some tea. Then I, I, real, I knew that she really liked it when I did that. So I began to realize that it were some practical applications, but it also, you could use it to really uh, cement some social relations. She went ahead to study the social implications of digital money transfer. A part of my work has been to find out who sends money to who and why. And I found that money tends to circulate. Uh, for example, in, in family life, people send, tend to send money and it tends to circulate around. If there is one person in a family who's working, that person will often send and then in the rural areas many people will start to benefit from those funds as they circulate around. Uh, I also discovered that uh, women tend to get a lot more money on their phones than, than their husbands mm -hmm. did and that men did and that this was a very important way for women to start exercising some economic decision making. Her husband's longest professional engagement was at the Field Museum of Natural History that is based in Chicago where he spent 20 years. Uh, there had not been um, a curator for African ethnology, archaeology and ethnology for nearly 50 years. And so there was this huge gap uh, that was there. People had forgotten that there was a very rich uh, African collection. And so we began by 
uh, assembling and uniting that collection. When I got there, the African uh, collection had been placed in different places. It is at that museum where the skins of two lions, commonly known as the man-eaters of Tsavo, are preserved. The lions interrupted the construction of the Kenya-Uganda Railway for nine months. Uh, it took uh, Colonel Patterson, uh, who was an, ing an engineer that had been brought to build the Savo Bridge, uh, about nine months to track these two, these two lions. Uh, these two lions were, were killed, and then eventually in 1924, long after Colonel Patterson had retired, returned to England when he was out in the United States talking about promoting his book, basically. Um, the film museum president asked what, has happened, had, what had happened to the lion skins. And he said, well, he had these lion skins in his living room. So the film museum offered to buy these lion skins. There are those who wonder why the skins of the man-eaters should be in Chicago and not in Kenya. But Professor Kusimba says the skins are key to marketing Kenya from where they are preserved. Every year, about 70,000 Americans visit East Africa as tourists. Many of these uh, people who come to East Africa go to places like Savo. And some of them have actually known about the Savo lions. And so they want to go to Savo and see the descendants of these two lions. Uh, but I think the more serious question is what's happening to the lions that are still left in, in, in Kenya, right? How many lions get killed every year? How many elephants are being killed every year? Professor Kusimba's feature continues right after our Miles Away segment. On Miles Away today, we take a trip to Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States of America. Originally called the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. is named after two historical figures, that is, George Washington, the founding father and first president of the United States, and Christopher Columbus, the famous European explorer. It is also the place where civil rights activist Martin Luther King Jr. made his famous I Have a Dream speech. Washington, D.C. has a population of over 600,000 people and numerous tourist attractions. It is home to the Library of Congress, which is the largest library in the world. The city also has numerous international institutions, including the International Monetary Fund, commonly known as the IMF, as well as the World Bank. And that's miles away. My name is Michael Zimaji. Professor Kusimba, who teaches anthropology at the American University in Washington, D.C., has just been elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science for his contribution in the field of anthropology, a lifetime prestigious recognition that places him in the league of achievers like former U.S. President Barack Obama, who was also admitted to the Academy at the same time. The Kenyan scholar says, he has the interest of Kenya at heart. Uh, every year for the last 30 years, I spend every summer in Kenya. You can find me mostly on the Kenyan coast at Fort Jesus Museum, Lamu Museum, uh, out there at Kenyan sites working. If I'm not on the coast these days, as I get older, you find me in Western Kenya doing work, writing books and papers uh, on the deep history of, of Kenya. However, he regrets that Kenya is doing badly when it comes to supporting research. Today, uh, the government of Kenya doesn't give any funds for research to either Kenyan uh, university lecturers or even in research institutions such as the National Museums, Camry and others. If Colin, I talk to colleagues, they talk about struggling. There's no funding. So in most cases, I think, uh, uh, we count ourselves as being very fortunate because at least Americans are still willing to pay for, for research. And that's very, very important. You can't teach. Uh, you are only a good professor if you are also very actively engaged in 
in research and, and writing. Let's shift gears to the future of Kenyans in the diaspora. Professor Kusimba, being among the older generation of Kenyans living abroad, is worried that the future Kenyan diaspora will not have the interest of Kenya at heart. Kenya will always be in our heart. Kenya will, be always, will always come first to people like us. Our children, though, is a different thing. They are American, they are Canadian, they are Australian, they are English. And that's, if, I, if I'm in Kenya now, if I'm a policymaker in Kenya, I'll worry a lot. Remittances from Kenyans abroad are currently Kenya's topmost foreign exchange earner. This is under threat, he says, because the current generation will not be sending money and investing home the way the older generation has been doing. If I was a policymaker in Kenya, I would actually try to figure out how we can stop that and keep Kenyans uh, in the diaspora still interested in, in, uh, in Kenya beyond this first generation of the first members of the diaspora. Talk of remittances and Professor Kusimba has been investing back home. He owns a 200-acre farm in Kiminini, Transoia County, on which he practices conservation agriculture and has managed to plant over 400,000 trees in the last 10 years. We recently featured his contribution to environmental conservation in Kenya on our current affairs program, The Chamwada Report. And that brings us to the end of Professor Kusimba's story on Daring Abroad as we leave you with our diaspora bite. Following the promulgation of the new constitution, and uh, following also the launch of our diaspora policy, which was launched in 2015 by His Excellency the President, Kenyans were given that opportunity for dual nationality. Before, they could have been, you know, uh, prevented from participating in certain things because of the issue of dual nationality. But now, the diaspora, given that they have the dual nationality, they are free to participate just like any other Kenyans. They are not hindered at all. Equity Bank Diaspora Banking. Receive money from anywhere in the world. <laughs>